over the last uh, few lectures, we have seen the derivation of uh, conservation of mass, momentum and energy, right? We have kind of uh, finished that. So today we are going to list on all the equations and see if we kind of can find a common thread between them, okay? So the conservative form of the governing equations, okay? We will see what we mean by conservative form little later, okay. Uh, so these are uh, being written down for a compressible fluid uh, with a Newtonian approximation, okay. So this is for a compressible flow with Newtonian fluid, okay. So we have uh, this assumption. So uh, what does the, how does the mass conservation or continuity look like? So we have. Uh, Conservation of mass is uh, or the continuity equation is is what? Partial rho partial t plus del dot rho u bar equals 0, right? That is our conservation of mass. So, let us call it Cm, okay? And then our x momentum equation, uh, if I expand the total derivative that is uh, rho du dt, if I expand it into the local uh, derivative and the convective term, that would read like partial by partial t of rho u, right, plus we have del dot rho u u bar, right, this is rho times du dt equals on the right hand side we have minus partial p partial x plus, uh, so when I say x momentum equation we are actually writing down the uh, Navier-Stokes equations, okay. So this is, these are the uh, Navier-Stokes equations, okay, so minus partial p partial x plus uh, yesterday we have substituted the shear stresses in terms of the strain rates, right? And we have simplified uh, the right hand side terms and that would read as what? Del dot mu grad u, right? Plus we have a source term that is Smx, we call it prime, okay? So Smx prime where we realize that this uh, prime here would be a source that, that comes from the body force plus uh, several terms that are gradients of velocity, right, or strain rates that are also absorbed into this, okay. In the case, uh, if this was incompressible, then Smx, Sm prime x would be same as Smx. So, essentially whatever is the body force term that we get will only be there in that, okay. So, that we have to kind of keep in mind about the, about this source terms here, okay. Now, what about the y component of the uh, Navier-Stokes equation? So, the y component is partial rho v by partial t plus del dot rho v u bar equals minus partial p partial y plus del dot mu grad v, right, plus s prime m y, okay. Similarly, we have the z component that is rho w dot t plus del dot rho w u bar equals minus partial p partial z plus del dot mu grad w plus s prime mz, okay. Of course, now we have the energy equation as well. So, the energy equation is uh, in terms of the internal energy that is uh, tau by dot e of rho e plus del dot rho e u bar equals, what do we have on the right hand side for the energy equation? We had minus p times divergence of the velocity, okay, uh, plus we had del and dot k grad t, right plus we have the dissipation function which was the capital phi we said, right, plus we have some source term for the energy, right. Let us call it as S sub E, okay. So essentially we have all these uh, five uh, partial differential equations that are also coupled, right. So we have all these five equations and the unknowns are uh, as we discussed before, these are P, T, rho, E, U, V, W, right. So, these are all the uh, unknowns, right, essentially uh, seven unknowns. Uh, in addition to these equations, we also have the equation of state, right. So, the equation of state is uh, given by P equals uh, P of rho t as well as E equals uh, E of rho t, right. So, the internal energy and the pressure, uh, both of them are related to the equation of state, okay. 
So now we have uh, 5 plus 2, 7 equations and 7 unknowns, right? So the system is completely balanced and uh, we can solve for this, okay? Ah, okay. All right. Questions till now on this part? So by the way, please feel free to ask questions, okay? Uh, any questions till now? Yes. Uh, yes. Well, I did not consider uh, viscosity as a constant as such here, right? Viscosity still could be varying because I have mu inside the divergence operator, right? I only said uh, shear stresses are proportional to the strain rates, right? The viscosity can still be varying with, with temperature or with space. That's why I still haven't left the mu uh, outside the divergence operator. Ah, okay. So usually the viscosity is known because the properties of the fluid are known, right? So viscosity is not an unknown in these equations. Okay. It may vary, but you know how it varies with temperature or with space. That is, that is known to you. Of course, if you include viscosity as an unknown in these equations, then you would need a description for how viscosity varies. You already know the viscosity of the fluid, that with that what you are solving for, yes. That is already known, right? Now, of course, if you, like what we discussed yesterday, if you consider a constant viscosity and uh, an incompressible fluid, then you can further simplify these equations in the source terms that we have, right? Other questions? No? Okay. So, what we observe from this is, we have uh, several of these equations and there is a, a good, good amount of uh, commonality between all these equations, right? What we see here is that uh, all, the, all these terms on the left hand side have a, a transient term and there is a convection term and on the right hand side we have uh, some kind of a, a divergence term, right? Del dot uh, something uh, and there are of course some source terms, okay? So, the idea is can we... Uh, write all of these equations with a, a single equation, okay? And then uh, vary one particular quantity, okay? Such that we can uh, get any of the equation that we like from that single equation, okay? So essentially our life will be simple because then we have to only worry about developing solution methods only for that equation and substitute the corresponding variables uh, for that particular uh, variable that we consider, okay? So, what, what, are we, what I'm trying to mean is essentially, what I'm trying to say is we will now replace all these equations with a single equation, which we call it as a, uh, for a particular property uh, phi, okay? So, I would write an equation that would be uh, partial rho phi by partial t plus de del dot rho phi u bar equals del dot gamma grad phi plus S phi, okay? So essentially what we have is, we have an equation here where uh, uh, the first term is again the rate of increase of phi, right? Rate of increase of phi for a fluid element, right? Plus the uh, net rate of flow of phi out of the fluid element equals the net rate of increase of phi due to diffusion and the net rate of increase of phi uh, due to the source terms, okay? Okay, that's what we have. We have all these uh, four terms. Now, uh, do you see that this equation can aptly describe all other equations? Is it in a similar form? Yes, it is, right? It is in a similar form. Only thing is that we have to somehow uh, assign a particular value for phi as well as this diffusion coefficient gamma such that we can retrieve uh, the corresponding equations that we want from these, uh, all the five equations of conservation of mass, Navier-Stokes equations and the energy equation, right? So that's what we're going to do. Uh, so, this uh, particular equation that we have written down in terms of phi is known as uh, the uh, general scalar transport equation, okay? Of course, this uh, general scalar transport equation can also model uh, any other scalars that you have in a flow. For example, you want to track for pollutants or you want to track for any other species as part of your solution which will also have look similar to the equations that we have written. So, you have to just assign phi to be equal to that species value and then you will be able to model that extra equation that you would get as part of this general scalar transport equation, okay? Now, of course, we also realize that if I set uh, 
different values, let's say phi equals 1, if I set phi equals 1, I am going to uh, get on the left hand side here, if I set phi equals 1, I am going to get the conservation of mass, right. Of course, I have to set the corresponding value for gamma, which would be what? 0, right. I would set gamma equals 0 and S phi equals 0, right, which would give me the uh, conservation of mass. Similarly, if I set phi equals u, right, and uh, gamma equals what? Mu and S phi equals some S prime x plus um, essentially minus dou p dou x. We have not yet figured out how to put this term, so I am going to kind of uh, uh, dump this pressure gradient term into the source for now, okay. Uh, then we are going to get, if you plug in all these quantities, you are going to get the u x component of the Navier-Stokes equations, isn't it? Okay, so this would give you the x component of the Navier-Stokes equation, okay. Similarly, you can set phi equals v little e or a species concentration and things like that and obtain uh, any of the equations that you want by accordingly setting the values for gamma as well as uh, the source terms S phi, okay. So, those have to be accordingly assigned, okay. So, now this equation, the general scalar transport equation is the, is the fundamental equation that we will be working with throughout this entire course. Uh, this is the uh, basic equation that we will use uh, in the finite volume method that we are going to discuss as part of this course. So, this is the starting point for all the things that we are going to develop, yes. Uh, how does the general scalar transport, the question is how does the general scalar transport equation show the energy equation, okay. So, essentially uh, that is a good question. So, essentially what do you set? You have to set phi equals E, right or T or H naught, right. Now, the question is the confusion here is that the divergence operator on the right hand side has uh, temperature, right, whereas on the left hand side you have little E, right. So, essentially if you write an equation in terms of E, you would write the K as C V times T. So, accordingly you have to set the gamma as C V times uh, T or K by uh, C V, right. Then you can essentially get the corresponding value for here, right. So, you, you either set phi equals, so I would set phi equals let us say E, right or I can also set phi equals T or H naught to get the energy equation. If I work with uh, phi equals E, then my left hand side is retrieved right, whereas on the right hand side I have these two terms which is minus p times del dot u capital uh, phi and S e, all of these will go into the source term, right. We have not yet, uh, so essentially this part, this part and this part will all go to the S phi term, right. And then uh, what about this guy, how do you, how much do you set for gamma here? It has to be in terms of T, right. So, K C V, right that would give you your temperature here, okay. Or if you write in terms of temperature, it should be K upon C V, right. Accordingly, you have to set these values and you can retrieve the energy equation also, okay. Uh, there are only two unknowns. So, essentially density and temperature are the unknowns. So, instead of writing this equation for temperature, we have written in terms of internal energy E, right. So, I could even write this equation in terms of temperature, right. If I write for a, if I have a perfect gas, right, E equals uh, C V T, right, in which case I can rewrite this equation as the uh, partial, partial T of rho C V T, right. So, the energy equation will be an equation for temperature, right, if you have a perfect gas. If you do not have, then you have to use the additional thermodynamic relations uh, given by the equation of state that are given here to substitute for those values. Is that clear? Yeah, okay. Other questions? All right, so now we all agree that uh, we can work with this general scalar transport equation uh, in terms of uh, discretizing it and, and, and we can use these different terms that we have and later on at any point we can retrieve whatever equations we want from by substituting the corresponding values for phi as well as gamma as well as the source term S phi, okay. Uh, so, this is the fundamental equation that we will be working with in a finite volume method which is known as a scalar transport equation or a general scalar transport equation, okay. Now, the key step or the main step in uh, in the finite volume method is, is the integration of the uh, general scalar transport equation, okay. Uh, 
which I write it as G S T E that is the general scalar transport equation. So, the main step or the key step in finite volume method is always to integrate this or any equation that we get on a on a control volume ok. So, we would choose a control volume and we would integrate uh, the differential equation that we have on this particular in, on this particular control volume ok. So, that is the first step in finite volume method. Now, we are going to do the same thing. Um, so, I am going to integrate uh, the general scalar transport equation that is given here on a control volume ok. So, we are essentially performing a volume integral ok. So, that which is going to give me uh, on a control volume the first term is the transient term that is partial partial T of rho phi right T v plus control volume. The second term is the divergence of the convection term essentially del dot rho uh, phi u bar d v equals on the right hand side we have control volume uh, del dot gamma grad phi d v plus integral control volume s phi d v ok. Here uh, little v is the uh, d v is the differential volume of the of the control volume we have chosen ok. So, this is the differential volume. Okay. All right. Now, we have all these terms. Uh, now, what we do is uh, we invoke the uh, Gauss uh, divergence theorem and we are going to replace uh, the volume integral that is the convection term as well as the diffusion term these two volume integrals. Uh, so, we are going to use Gauss divergence theorem and then we are going to convert the volume integrals to surface integrals ok. Ok, now uh, why do we do, do this step? I leave it to you to understand ok or else we can discuss later on uh, why do we do this. Uh, fine, so if I if I convert this thing what does Gauss divergence theorem say? Gauss divergence theorem says that if you have a control volume right, if you have a divergence of a vector a bar on a particular volume d v this is equal to integration of this particular quantity on the entire surface right in the direction of the surface areas over the all the uh, surface area that is bounded uh, that is bounding this control volume right. So, essentially this is a control surface a bar dot d a bar is what we have right. So, this is your Gauss divergence theorem where uh, the divergence of a vector an integration on a particular control volume would be equal to the sum of the uh, a right in the direction of the surface areas. This control surface is bounding this uh, control volume ok. Ok, now uh, yeah, which one? What, what is not matching dimensions? Uh, why are they not matching? So, the left hand side is a is a scalar or a vector velocity where is velocity this one d v. So, d v is a volume this little v is a volume ok. So, I would use this v for velocity this one for volume ok. So, essentially we are we are talking about uh, divergence of a vector right summed over the entire volume by taking these differential volumes right that is what we have done here these are all these dv's are the differential volumes not the velocities right. We are not integrating with respect to velocity ok. So, is that clear right everybody agrees this is correct Gauss divergence theorem ok. Now, of course, I can also write it in a different way I can write this as uh, uh, integral over the control surface if uh, the surface has n cap as the surface normal this would be equal to a bar dot n cap uh, times d a right where d a now is a scalar. So, where n cap is the uh, surface normal or a unit surface normal ok. That is what we have either I can write it as a dot d a bar or a a bar dot n cap times d a ok. What this says is that the divergence of a vector summed over the entire control volume using differential volumes is nothing but the component of a bar right the component of a bar in the direction of the surface normal right. Um, summed over the entire surfaces that bound the control volume ok. So, that is what we have from the 
um, gas divergence theorem. So, we are going to use this and replace the, uh, the convection term and the uh, diffusion term okay of the of the general scalar transport equation okay so let us do that so that would give me uh, i would leave the first term as it is that is uh, uh, control volume so essentially this is uh, i'm also making one assumption here i'm assuming that the the control volume is not changing with respect to time okay so that i can take out the time derivative outside this control volume so i'm assuming that the time derivative and the control volume commute so that will be partial partial t integral control volume rho phi d little v this is the differential volume plus over the control surface. Now what is the what is the a bar here that we have rho phi u bar is my a bar now right. So I could write this as a del dot rho phi u bar dv I can write it as control surface rho phi u bar uh, n cap dA r dot dA bar okay equals on the right hand side control surface uh, the del dot gamma grad phi right this particular term I am writing it as gamma grad phi is a vector right gamma grad phi dot n cap d a right. So, this will be ga gamma grad phi uh, dot n cap d a plus integral control volume s phi d v okay all right everybody okay with this equation fine we have just used the Gauss divergence theorem. So, we are going to do this for in the entire course okay. So, for each of the equations we get okay. Now, uh, what we see is that we see something uh, very interesting okay. Now, we have performed an integration and what we see is that the integration has resulted in a, a kind of a conservative or a statement of conservation right. So, essentially it resulted in a statement of conservation okay why do we say it's a statement of conservation because if you look at the terms what does the first term indicate the first term indicates that for the control volume that we have the rate of change of rho phi right or phi inside the control volume is the first term so this is uh, rate of uh, increase of phi inside the control volume is the first term plus uh, what does the second term mean second term means that the rate of phi that is uh, going through the surfaces right going out right because n cap always let us say if you assume n cap always points in the outward direction of this control volume then all this is is leaving the control volume through the surfaces. So, this is uh, rate of uh, let us say decrease of phi out of the control surfaces right of the volume uh, or we can say out of the control surfaces of the boundary or we can just say control surfaces that is fine control surfaces uh, equals then what do we have here diffusion term. So, this is again rate of increase of uh, phi due to diffusion right plus we have again here uh, rate of increase of phi due to source terms right. So, that is what we have. So, essentially this is a statement of conservation. Now, uh, you may not be surprised because okay what is the big deal in this we have started off with a similar term right, but we have ended up with a, a similar conservation equation right. Initially we started off with without the control volume terms we started off with one equation which was uh, also a conservation statement, but now again we ended up with a statement of conservation for the control volume okay. So, this is important which is the main characteristic of the finite volume method in which for each of the control volumes you, you choose the conservation will be satisfied uh, for the phi okay for the property phi okay. So, this is this is the characteristic of the finite volume method. So, it essentially satisfies conservation per control volume basis okay. So, every control volume that you take that means every cell or you know the mesh cell that you take is going to satisfy conservation okay. So, there is a physical reasoning behind uh, the solution that you obtain okay. Now, this was all possible uh, because in the first place we have left the equation that we had before 
uh, if you go back, we had these equations, right? We wrote the equation as del dot rho phi u bar, right? We have written this as del dot rho phi u bar, as a result of which we can use the gauss divergence theorem and we could get rho phi u bar dot n cap, right? Now, if you go little further up, we started off with saying, okay, we're going to talk about conservative form, okay? Now, conservative form refers to this particular convection term, that is this del dot rho u u or del dot rho v v and so on. All these things, when you have divergence of something, okay, as one term, this is the, the conservative form, okay? Now, you may ask, okay, then what is a non-conservative form? A non-conservative form is one where you do not write like del dot rho u u bar, right? For example, now you can expand this del dot rho u u bar as two terms, right? Like what we have done before. You could consider uh, rho u bar to be together, right? And you could write this as rho u bar, right? Dotted with del dot u and so on, right? So, you can write uh, this as a two expressions, in which case you would get, uh, you can use again continuity equation to simplify and so on. So, if you expand it out like that, then it is not a conservative form, okay? That is a non-conservative form, okay? Wherein you would not write the equations as del dot rho u u bar, okay? So, uh, but you usually work with a non-conservative form in the context of finite difference methods, okay? Because a finite difference method does not involve integration on a particular control volume, okay? So, you never have to invoke gauss divergence theorem at all, okay? So, as a result, uh, finite difference methods would not result in a statement of conservation on a cell by cell basis. But of course, you cannot solve for something which does not satisfy the physical laws. So, that means finite difference method would definitely stat satisfy principle of conservation on the entire domain that you choose, but not on a element by element basis, okay? Whereas, that is satisfied on a cell by cell basis in finite volume method because you are now using this conservative form to integrate on a particular control volume and arrive at a, a statement of conservation, okay? Is that clear? So, that is the difference between a conservative form and a non-conservative form. You, you do not write this del dot as, as this thing, you expand this out as two terms, then you get a non-conservative form, okay? So, it is only that, uh, so if it is only that the, the final solution will be the same, but in a finite difference method you would be going through, uh, you may not be going through a, a conservative set of solutions. So, for example, if you had stopped your simulation halfway between, then a finite volume method, although may not be correct at that point, would still give you a, a conserved solution on every cells, okay? Whereas, a finite difference method may not give you a conserved solution at that uh, iteration, okay? But eventually, essentially, it is only difference between, so the final solution will be the same whether you use finite difference or finite volume. It is only that the, uh, the path you, to the solution is different, okay? The path to the solution goes through sequence of conservative solutions uh, for finite volume, whereas it need not be going through the same path if you take a finite difference method, okay? That is the only difference. We will uh, probably do one problem in the assignment where you can see the difference between conservative form and the non-conservative form, okay? And appreciate how they are different. And in fact, if you, we will again go through this little later. If you discretize uh, these forms, you will see that uh, the resulting equations you get to solve both from finite difference and finite volume method will look the same as long as you have, uh, as long as you have linearities in your problems, okay? So, if you have, the moment you start having non-linearities, you will see that the conservative form is, results in a very different uh, equations than finite difference method, okay? That is what you will see uh, in terms of these differences. Other questions, okay? Fine, uh, then let us move on. Okay, so it kind of satis, yeah. Yeah, net rate of decrease of a uh, fee uh, essentially through the boundaries, I would not say out of. So, essentially decrease of fee uh, through the control surface, right? So, we say decrease because it is leaving, right? Del dot u, so this essentially is leaving the control volume. That is why uh, through the surfaces, that is why I call it as a decrease, right? P, that's right. So essentially, it is the net rate of decrease because it's kind of leaving the, it's going out of the control volume, right? Because it's positive, okay? But of course, if you have a negative term that is coming inside, right? That will be there as well. Well, if you, if you have a rotational flow, you can write it as a, you know, gradient of a potential function, right? And so on for the diffusion equation. But, uh, but in this context, when we say 
the conservation is satisfied, we ought to mean is you have a balance equation, you know, you have a, essentially you have something that is created in the cell, something that is leaving the cell and something there is an accumulation in the cell. So that balance equation is what we call it as conservation here, okay. But of course you can of course you write this as a gradient of a potential function and so on, right. Other questions? Right. Okay, that is the question I asked you to think about it and you are asking me back. Okay. So, this is my question back to me. Uh, so, why did I do the, okay, you, you will probably be clear a little later. So, the thing is, okay, if I do not do the gas divergence theorem, um, what, so for example, if you see, uh, kind of look through this thing, what we kind of did is we kind of uh, have one term for the control volume, right one term for the control volume and then these two terms we have converted into control surfaces, right. So, if I do not have, do not convert them into control surfaces, I just leave it as control volumes, what will happen to the equation I would get eventually. So, essentially I have some terms, I am integrating them on a control volume, right. The control volume could be represented with one cell centroid, right. Everything will become dependent on this cell centroid, that is all. So, essentially you do not have any connection to your neighbors. Right? So, essentially you have a set of equations which are all disconnected. Right? Essentially you have, for every control volume you will have one equation. There is no connection between the cells at all. Now, to bring in the connection between the cells, we are saying that uh, we are replacing this convection which is going through the surfaces uh, in a more physical way where I would say write it as that is going through the surface. Now, when we model this uh, particular thing, this particular control surface, we would again make use of the corresponding control volumes that share this control surface, right. As a result, we are bringing this, we are bringing in this connection between the control volumes through this particular control surface, okay. As a result, the equations you would get will be a set of linear equations, right, which are all connected. They kind of start, de start depending on the neighbors, okay. That is how it is. Otherwise, you would have one equation which is all in terms of one particular cell, right. That is what we did, which you cannot do anything with it, right. That is what we did, okay. I thought, uh, you will tell me the answer, but I have told the answer. Okay, fine. Uh, any other questions? No? Okay. So, this is kind of the fundamental equation. Now, of course, if you have a steady state problem, so if we have a steady state problem, then the first term drops out, then all we have is control surface rho phi u bar uh, dot n cap d a equals control surface gamma grad phi dot n cap d a plus integral control volume s phi d little b, okay. That is a steady state problem which is obvious because we have set essentially this term to uh, go to 0, okay. Uh, now, in, in general, you would probably have uh, transient problems as well, okay. You will have unsteady problems as well, uh, in which case, just like we have, so if you have a uh, transient or uh, unsteady problems, then uh, just like we have integrated on a particular control volume, we have to also integrate uh, this partial partial t on a particular time interval, okay. So, essentially we have to integrate from a known time t to another known time, another time t plus delta t by an interval delta t, okay. So, we have to introduce a integration in time, okay, as well, just like we have integrated in space for the control volume, you have to integrate in time as well for this uh, equation because we cannot leave partial partial t in there, okay. So, if you integrate then you have to integrate each and every term that you have in the equation, okay. So, that is going to give you uh, the uh, most general form, okay, of the integrated general scalar transport equation, okay. So, that is essentially now you have integral delta t okay. Uh, then we have uh, partial partial t integral control volume rho uh, phi dv, then we have dt, 
right? We are integrating with respect to space uh, here, and then we are int integrating with respect to time, okay? So we have this, so we have double integration here, plus integral over delta t, uh, integral over the control surfaces, right? We have rho phi u bar dot, either I can write n cap dA or I could just write dA bar, okay, times uh, dt, right? That is for the integration for the time equals, what is on the right hand side? We have again integral delta t, integral control surface, uh, we have the uh, del dot gamma grad phi, so this would be gamma grad phi dot uh, dA bar dt, right, plus integral delta t, integral delta, integ or integral over the control volume, right, uh, S phi dV dt, right, that is your uh, most general form of the transient or the integrated general scalar transport equation, okay. So we will be using this for unsteady problems, fine. Now, of course, we will make some assumptions in terms of how do we evaluate these surface integrals, the volume integrals, and how do we evaluate this uh, time integration, okay. All these things we will make uh, certain assumptions, okay. We will make use of some profile assumptions and then integrate them, right, because um, we are trying to solve for these, e these terms and of course, we do not know the terms themselves, how can we uh, integrate them, right. So, essentially you make a profile assumption assuming that the, these unknowns that we are solving for will vary in a certain manner and then we are going to say introduce that and integrate these equations, okay. That is what we are going to see uh, in the next lecture. So, we will we'll work with all this uh, integration of time and space for all the diffusion equation, convection diffusion equation and, and so on, okay. Fine. So, let us kind of move on uh, to the classification of physical problems, okay. or classification of physical behavior uh, because uh, in order to solve a problem, uh, we not just need a governing equations, we also need to know together with the governing equations, we need to know what? Boundary conditions. So, we need to know the initial uh, and or the boundary conditions, okay. Only then we can uh, form a well posed mathematical statement, okay. Okay, so now uh, the requirement of the initial and boundary conditions kind of stems from the kind of the physical behavior or the type of the equation we are looking at, okay. So, we will only know do we need an initial condition or do we need a boundary condition that depends on the type of the physical problem we are solving and also the based on the classification of the problem itself, okay. So, let us kind of classify the physical behavior of the fluid flow and heat transfer problems that we get often. Uh, so, we can kind of broadly categorize them into uh, equilibrium problems. And uh, marching, okay, marching problems, okay, either equilibrium problems or marching problems. Um, let us look at what is and what we mean by equilibrium problems, okay. So, few examples are the steady state heat conduction. So, all the steady state problems, we would call them as equilibrium problems, okay. So, all the steady state problems, for example, uh, steady state heat conduction problem, okay, or we have a um, the deflection of a solid object under a load and so on, okay, or any other uh, steady state problem. Okay. Uh, 
Now the governing equation for all these equilibrium problems are we have a kind of a representativity equation, a representative equation is, uh, is the Laplace equation, okay. And uh, these are also known as uh, elliptic problems, okay. These are also known as elliptic uh, equations or problems in the literature, okay. So all these are governed by uh, a representative equation that is known as the Laplace equation. Um, what is a Laplace equation? So a typical Laplace equation would look like ah, divergence of gradient of some scalar, right? That's what we have. So I can I can rewrite this as uh, partial p partial x square, right? partial phi partial y square equals 0, right. So that is a typical uh, equation for this kind of problems. Now what does this uh, represent? This represent of course as we discussed the steady state heat conduction in two dimensions. Uh, any other uh, physical behaviors this can be used to describe? that you have come across in fluid mechanics. Uh, the Laplace equation, irrotational flow, right? We had del square phi equals 0 in irrotational, right? Like if you have del square phi equals 0, this is uh, the governing equation for irrotational potential flow, essentially irrotational and incompressible flow, right? Okay, and so on. So we could use it to kind of represent these steady state problems, okay. So one example could be if you consider a, uh, if you consider a 1D problem, for example, let's say we have a, a solid uh, rod where we keep one end at T naught, another end at a higher temperature T L and if we insulate the, all the sides of it, right. So in a steady state and if you assume that there is no a source as part of this thing. So if you have a steady state heat conduction, the solution would look something like this if you have, if there is no heat generation, right, okay, fine. Uh, so this is your X naught and X L, all right. Now um, what, what kind of boundary conditions do we need to specify or initial conditions do we need to specify for solving these problems? Do we, we have to specify a condition on the solution variable that we are solving for, let us say for example phi, right, we have to specify either phi or its derivative partial phi partial n, right, needs to be specified on, or do we have to specify on all the boundaries or only on few boundaries? We have to specify on all the boundaries right, uh, in order to, in order to be able to solve this equation, right. So because for example here in the 1D problem, we have to specify T at x equal to 0 and T at x equal to L, right, uh, so that we can solve for this 1D heat conduction problem. Uh, so these kind of, do we have to specify a transient, uh, do we have to specify a initial condition also for this? We do not have to because there is no time derivative in this thing, so there is no need for an initial condition, but we have to specify a boundary condition on all the boundaries that we have, okay. In terms of either you specify uh, the variable itself or a derivative of that, right, okay. Now these kind of problems are known as uh, what? Boundary value problems which require values to be specified on all the boundaries of the domain, okay. Now these are, uh, uh, these boundary value problems are elliptic equations have a elliptic equations have certain characteristics. So these characteristics are kind of important to look at. For example, if there is a, uh, there is a sudden increase of temperature in anywhere in the solution domain, okay. If you are let us say solving for a 2D problem, okay, and uh, if there is a sudden increase of temperature because of a source or something like this, now this uh, sudden increase would be propagated in all directions, okay. It will get, it will get diffused in all directions, okay. 
as a result the solution you are going to get will be always smooth ok. So, because any disturbances you have in the flow field would be propagated in all directions ok. So, the solutions obtained are smooth uh, even if you have discontinuities in the boundary condition. So, even if you have even if there are discontinuities in the boundary conditions ok. Even then the solutions obtained are smooth ok and they have to kind of propagate in all directions. Now, this is a kind of very convenient thing to devise numerical methods to solve for elliptic problems ok. That means, the numerical methods that you that you would devise uh, have to take this into account wherein. So, the numerical schemes that you want to use uh, have to be such that they produce uh, these smooth uh, solutions right and also they should be able to send the information in all directions. So, if you have a numerical scheme that does not satisfy these things then the solutions you are going to get out of the elliptic solution would not be correct ok. So, that is how that is why we are learning uh, the physical uh, classification of these problems ok such that we can devise better numerical schemes for our solution methods ok fine. So, these are kind of the insights from an elliptic equation. Now, what about the marching problems? Marching or propagating problems? Propagation problems. So, all the uh, transient uh, problems are all considered as marching problems ok. So, we have all the transient problems. So, where we have an unsteady term these are known as uh, marching problems ok. Now, in the marching problems we can kind of classify further into two different things. One we call it as uh, parabolic type of equations. The other one we call it as uh, hyperbolic type of equations ok, uh, uh, but both of them kind of belong to the transient uh, flow problems ok. So, we are going to see uh, how these two kind of differ and a working equation for it and the characteristics etcetera in the ok. Thank you.